My name is Jenny Stevens. I am a faculty member here at the University of Vermont, and I will be facilitating this uh, second panel in which we will move from considering the past um, to focusing on the current situation and understanding the current state of complex electric energy relationships. Uh, my own research and teaching here at the University of Vermont focus on the renewable energy transition and societal responses to climate change. And obviously hydropower is a critical piece of the renewable energy transition. So it is both a pleasure and an honor to be part of the organizing committee uh, for this very important conference. As we struggle with the implications of climate change and how fossil fuel reliance is resulting in climate instability, uh, energy volatility, and social and economic vulnerability, uh, we are faced with the huge challenge of reducing fossil fuel dependency. Beyond the threats of climate change, there are many other compelling reasons to reduce fossil fuel use, including enhancing geopolitical, secu in geopolitical security, increasing energy independence and self-reliance, improving public health, and creating more stable, predictable, and resilient energy systems. But as we consider this transition from away from fossil fuels toward renewable energy, it is clear that the different types of renewable energy are associated with different opportunities and different challenges. And it's also becoming clear that the very different scales within which renewable energy can be deployed, ranging from large scale utility scale renewables versus small scale lo local distributed renewable generation also offer very different opportunities and challenges with regard to grid integration as well as local and community scale issues. Many of us are acutely aware that the renewable energy transition is not a simple technical substitution from fossil fuels to renewables. This transition will ultimately also require change in energy consumption, including much more aggressive efficiency programs, energy conservation, as well as social and cultural changes in our own expectations and assumptions for how we use and relate to energy. It is within this context that we turn now to hear about the current state of the electric energy relationships including current contracts, policy initiatives, as well as social and environmental concerns. We will start with Ann George, the Vice President for External Affairs and Corporate Communications in ISO New England. Then we will hear from John Castle, a Vermonter who has just recently left the Conservation Law Foundation where he was president from 2009 to 2014. We will then hear from Jean-Thomas Bernard, who is a professor at the University of Ottawa and also Université Laval. And then Stephen Maladets, the Vice President of Hydro-Quebec, United States. So once again, like the previous panel, we have asked each speaker to provide uh, brief remarks of eight minutes or less. And after we hear from all four speakers, we will open it up for an interactive session uh, with all of you. And we welcome your questions and comments and uh, interactions. So let's start off, Anne, with, with your first um, presentation. There we go. Great. Thank, you. Thank you, Jenny, and good morning, everyone. Um, I wish I could give part of my presentation in English and part in French, because I love that. Uh, but unfortunately, I don't speak any. I can say bonjour. That's about it. Um, so uh, good morning. And um, is Louise still here? Because she called me out a couple of times in her presentation. I wanted to do the same for her. But no, no, no. She ran. She ran. Um, but uh, it is a pleasure to be up here in Vermont and uh, to bring some um, you know, a sense of what's happening in the region um, and what what we're dealing with on a regional level. Um, we often come to Vermont, uh, we, we manage, um, at ICE New England, we manage the regional system and we work with all six of the New England states 
Uh, so we often come up to Vermont to learn about uh, what the policy goals are and what the initiatives are in, in Vermont so that we can understand what that will mean for the regional system. Um, but, and then a, a situation like this, a conversation like this with our neighbors in Quebec is, is very important uh, for, the, for ISO New England and for the region to understand. So I appreciate being here. So let's get going. So ISO New England, uh, I think most of you in the room uh, are aware of who we are. We are the independent system operator for the regional electricity grid. Um, we are not a regulator. We are regulated by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Um, we um, uh, are not policymakers. Um, we do work, as I mentioned, with the policymakers in the six New England states and try to understand uh, what uh, goals the states have, and we try to help facilitate that to the extent we can um, while we are um, doing our job of um, three important roles. Um, reliability is the core of what we are focused on, um, and we do this through uh, three important tasks. One is to um, operate the system um, day to day um, in a reliable manner. The uh, second important task we have is to manage and oversee the wholesale electricity markets, um, the, the buying and selling of electricity um, in the market and ensure that those markets remain competitive. And then finally, we do look out over a 10-year horizon to look at system needs and determine um, what is changing with um, the, the demand on the system, what's changing with potential retirements and new resources coming on, and what the transmission and system needs will be uh, looking into the future. So our transmission system, we've actually, as a region, done a, a, a lot of investment um, in to, the, to ensuring that our transmission grid is reliable. Um, there were decades of, of um, maybe a lesser, lesser amounts of investment into the transmission system, um, but over the past 15 years or so, we've really um, made some of those investments, uh, built projects, uh, the, the utility companies that own the transmission system have built projects in each of the six New England states. ISO New England does not own any of this transmission, but we do have operating agreements and we operate uh, the transmission system in a non-discriminatory manner. Uh, we uh, have um, 13 interconnections with our neighbors, so our, our interconnections with the neighboring systems are very important to the system. Last year, as you see here, we uh, had 16% of our regional energy needs were met by imports from those, for those neighboring systems. And I mentioned that we've invested a lot, uh, $7 billion um, as a whole uh, among the transmission projects in the region, and we have a, another approximately $4.5 billion uh, planned um, in various stages in planning through, through uh, the next several years. Uh, these are the ties to our neighbors. Um, as you can see, and we're, we've got many ties to New York. Um, that DC tie is through the Long Island Sound. Uh, we have two ties to Hydro-Quebec and two ties to New Brunswick. Um, so we do work closely with those regions and understanding what's happening in those regions, as well as sharing information about what's happening in New England so that they understand our system needs and uh, system characteristics. So uh, I wanted to make a point to, to what Louise said earlier, and actually uh, John uh, on our panel here was, was commenting the same. You know, Louise, from, a, from her vantage point, she said, you know, a lot of the discussions that happened in the 80s, uh, there's not much different than the discussions happening uh, today. And so Louise, I wasn't around in the 80s, or in, in the energy world, I was around. <laughs> but in the energy world, I wasn't around. And, um, but, so in my time frame in the energy world, we are in the midst of a lot of change. And so, you know, it's, it's interesting to see the different perspectives. But from what's happening in the system right now in New England, we have uh, moved from our, our uh, generation, our fuel of choice has moved from oil and coal to natural gas. We still have a decent amount of uh, nuclear on the system and renewables are starting to increase, um, but the, the growth in the actual capacity in the steel in the ground, the plants that we have in New England, 
has been dominated by natural gas generation. And if you look at what plants are producing electrical en energy for the region, um, you see here that natural gas dominates. We had 44% of our electrical energy last year was produced by our natural gas uh, generation resources. Um, nuclear makes up a big chunk of that as well. And these are 2014 numbers. We had Vermont Yankee on the system uh, in 2014. It closed down at, at the end of last year. And so we'll see what those numbers are for 2015. But as you can see, the, the energy production is coming primarily from the natural gas fleet. And, and you see here the oil and coal. Oil has dropped down to produce only 1% of our um, energy over the year um, and coal at 5%. During the winter months, however, those uh, two resources, two fuel sources, are producing a, a larger chunk of our electrical energy during the winter months because of the constraints on the natural gas pipeline system coming into the region. Uh, we have had seen difficulties from the natural gas generation sector accessing the natural gas fuel uh, to produce energy. And so what's taking up the slack there is the oil and coal. And so this shift to um, predominantly natural gas uh, for, gener for generation purposes, um, we can see the Im impact of that in our wholesale electricity prices. Um, you see here that those high spikes are driven in the winter months by the cost of natural gas. Um, because we have so much natural gas on the system, that usually sets the price for, for wholesale electricity in our energy markets. And it really tracks that price. And, and in the past several winters, you see these, these price spikes. Um, last winter, the one we're not currently in, even though it's technically spring, I still, we're in winter. Um, uh, the last one, um, we really saw dr some dramatic price spikes. Um, natural gas prices in New England were the highest of any place in the world uh, last winter um, in New England. And so um, we're seeing that, that drive the costs in the wholesale electricity market. They, they weren't as dramatic this winter, even with the terrible winter we've had. Um, and that, that's driven primarily because we, ha we saw lower prices um, for, because of the lower oil prices, but because we had a, a decent amount of liquefied natural gas come into the region, um, and that alleviated some of the, the um, demands and, and what we saw in the pipeline system driving up the price. This transformation in our fleet has also resulted in um, some good news in our emissions profile. We've seen over the last 15 years or so uh, emissions go down in the region. Um, they've they've um, gone down substantially because of that shift away from the dirtier fossil fuels of coal and oil. However, uh, in the past uh, couple of winters, we've seen that uh, level off and, and actually start to increase a bit because we have now gone back to using some of that oil and coal that had almost gone out of our system, um, but we've, we've had to um, go back to that. Um, and it actually, it's, and it's interesting, coal and oil has, um, or oil in particular, has been more economic than natural gas, and so it runs in our, our markets based on an economic uh, reason, not necessarily for reliability purposes. Um, so you see this uh, start to have a, a little uptick. Um, these are up through 2013, so it doesn't capture 2014 or the, the winter that we're currently in. Um, but we expect to see that, that, um, that trend continue while we're in this situation where we are relying more and more on coal and oil than we had in the past. So renewables, um, you know, the, this is something that's of great interest, a great interest to us, but also great interest to the, the policymakers in the region. Uh, the, the drive for renewable energy is uh, something that will continue. And we see that right now, they don't make up a huge amount of our energy uh, capacity in the region, but it is growing. It is um, uh, growing at a fairly good uh, rate. Uh, wind in particular, wind is something that is probably the area that you will see the most growth in renewable resources. Uh, wind 
we currently have about 800 megawatts on the system, but there's a lot of desire to build wind in the region. A lot of it is in northern Maine, and it is challenged because the transmission system in northern Maine um, is uh, uh, not robust enough to interconnect all of this wind. Um, but we see 4,000 megawatts are interested in being developed into the region. Doesn't necessarily mean that it'll all get developed, but a good chunk of that will likely get developed, especially if we can figure out collectively uh, the transmission uh, needs and transmission system up there. Solar, solar, I know Vermont it has a big push to do uh, solar. Um, other states, Massachusetts in particular, uh, Connecticut, they are doing their own solar programs and so we see solar coming on strong. Most of it is behind the meter at the distribution level. Uh, we do not see this in our operations, but we are tracking it because we understand now it's getting to a place where it's large enough that it can have an impact um, uh, in terms of what our operators are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so this actually um, are the two 2013 numbers. We recently uh, put out a draft forecast for solar PV and it increased the numbers. We think that we uh, currently have about 900 megawatts uh, of solar out there in the region and we expect um, over 2,000 megawatts of uh, uh, photovoltaics to be developed uh, by the year 2023. So that, that uh, is an area of growth. And then I know there was some discussion on the first panel on energy efficiency. The states are spending approximately a billion dollars a year on energy efficiency. It's a, it's a big resource um, for the states and for um, managing the, the um, system, managing the growth in uh, demand. And as you can see here, we um, have approximately 1,300 megawatts of energy efficiency, and that is projected to grow to over 3,000 megawatts on, as, on the region. And so um, finally, I just uh, want to wrap up with transmission again, back to transmission. And this is transmission that's not necessarily, uh, we haven't labeled it as needed for reliability. Um, it is, these are various projects that are being talked about as ways to bring additional clean energy into the region. Um, they uh, range from um, bringing hydro down from Quebec, um, hydro down from New Brunswick, um, wind projects in Maine down to load centers in southern New England. Um, but there's a lot of discussion out there and a lot, there's been a lot of discussion about many of these projects for years. There's a little more interest and a little more discussion right now because we've seen the states, the New England states, start talking about doing something collectively on this. Uh, the three southern New England states have issued a request for proposals on uh, transmission projects to bring clean energy down. Um, so there's a lot of discussion going on. From ISO New England standpoint, we don't necessarily do much with these projects other than to study them to ensure that they can safely and reliably interconnect into the regional system. Um, we, uh, these aren't projects that will kind of go through our reliability system planning process. Uh, they won't have the same cost allocation um, of, uh, among the New England states as some of the reliability projects I spoke about earlier. Um, so these are projects that we are obviously involved in and looking at and, and interested to see where they go. But it's hard to know which of these projects will materialize. Um, it's up to the developers and I know that, that we'll have some further discussion on that. Um, so I think I'll stop there and um, look forward to the Q&A. Good morning. Um, thank you, um, Dave and Richard and Jenny, for organizing the conference. I particularly, as a Vermonter and a Burlington resident, I would like to add my welcome to our friends and guests from north of the border. It's been a pleasure to spend some time with you, and I, for one, found the 
conversation in the first session, very enlightening, an opportunity to really understand, dig a little bit deeper than the very superficial level of understanding that I could, that I had, um, into some of the dynamics north of the border that I, uh, are obviously very important. Um, we have similar dynamics south of the border, as you may understand, and, and I suspect that we'll get into those as we go on uh, for the day, during the day. I'm John Castle. I'm in the program as the former president of the Conservation Law Foundation, which is certainly true. It's something I'm very proud of. I, I want to issue the uh, uh, clear disclaimer, though, that I'm here in my individual capacity today and not speaking officially on behalf of Conservation Law Foundation. I would say that my excellent former colleague, Sandy Levine, who is um, uh, with Conservation Law Foundation now, is here in the audience and um, can speak on behalf of the organization if any questions are put in uh, its direction. I would say that CLF has a unique position uh, with respect to the issues that are under discussion here in that we are active in all of the, CLF is active in all of the six New England states and is very active in all of the energy issues in particular and especially those that relate to system planning and the way that fine organizations like ISO New England and all of the partners involved in keeping the lights on and supplying our energy needs um, do. So, um, Anne and I did just compare notes about Louise's provocative a uh, point early, earlier this morning, which I'm glad she made when she said, you know, everything's the same, it's all the same. Um, certain things are definitely the same, and, and I have great respect for my friend Louise McCarran. She's right, we still have inadequate rate structure. She's right about a lot of those things. I tend to think, though, that things are not the same at all as they were in the 80s. I think we're, it's a bit like an Escher print if you know what I mean, where you've got fish coming across the page on one side and you've got birds on the other side, and somewhere in the middle they start to blend, I think we're kind of in the middle right now. Uh, and if you're used to thinking of the fish side, we're still a school of fish, right? I think actually we don't know if we're going to end up being birds or something else. There's an enormous amount of change in the works right now, and very helpfully referred to some of it. A whole lot of it has to do with the changing mix with our um, dramatic increase in reliance on natural gas as an electric generating source, not to mention a source of energy for other purposes in New England over the last 20 years. Um, but from my perspective, and here I think I will reflect generally the environmental community's point of view, we have a firm understanding now that we didn't have five, 10 years ago or even five years ago, that we have to dramatically reduce carbon emissions in the first part of this century in order to um, avert or at least minimize massive destruction and suffering around the world. That's a bit of a downer statement, but I believe it's true. And when you really dwell on the, the gravity of the challenge, the enormity of the challenge and the gravity of the consequences if we don't rise to it, you start to whether we're, that Escher print starts to look different on the other side of the page. I've put up a very simple slide that comes from the Energy Information Agency, which shows the percent of CO2 emissions by sector of the economy. This is 2011 data for the New England states. Um, and it shows, as you can see, uh, this is percent by state, obviously, the populations are very different. But note that the electric power segment is not the leading cause or source of carbon emissions in any of the New England states. And, in, um, uh, and collectively, if you put it all together, it's actually something like a third. Uh, in transportation and space heating and all of our other energy uh, uses, we emit a lot more carbon through what we do. But the science tells us, and it's worth pausing about this, the science tells us, and there's really no debate about it anymore, that we need to reduce our carbon emissions by 80% below 1990 levels, which is roughly where we are right now, um, by 2050. That's economy-wide. That's not just the electric sector, right? So we could clean up the electric sector, make it a whole lot less carbon emitted, and not do anything about transportation or space heating and all the fossil fuels that, at least in this country, we're heavily reliant upon for those needs, and we're toast. We're not even going to come close to meeting that imperative. In fact, we need to shift a large portion, perhaps 
almost all of the fossil fuel energy, the carbon emissions from transportation to a non-carbon source. And that is very likely to be highly electric. So imagine that in the next 35 years, we have to not only decarbonize our existing electric load, but we're probably going to have to increase our electric load. A note on that is efficiency is a huge untapped resource. There is a great deal that we can do. There, there's a lot that we can do in order to make more of what we have now from electricity. But think of the magnitude of this. Look at those numbers. Vehicle miles travel continue to rise. Um, uh, fuel efficiency in cars is increasing. That's a good thing. But, I mean, in Vermont, it's 56.7% of our carbon emissions is from transportation. And we don't have a land use structure as much as we'd like to believe that we do in this state, for example, that's really going to support a lot of walking and pedestrian, uh, walking and transit. Um, this is a massive challenge for us. If we start to shift space heating, commercial and industrial use, and the transportation sector to the electric sector, it just gives you a sense of the nature of the challenge we have. So, and that challenge, I would note, is, um, I'll go forward, is, is similar, does not, do, what's working here? Arrow down. arrow down. Don't have an arrow down. The shelf, okay. Well, anyway, this is, um, just so that, just for context, this is also uh, similar to the national picture. So this is the, this is the challenge that we face. And I wanted to spend a minute or two on it because it's really important that we frame all of the discussions about the evolution of our energy system, our sources, and where we're going to get them from and what we're going to do with them uh, from this perspective. I would also note, not to dwell on uh, the gloom and doom, but it's also likely that in the middle of this century, uh, New England will be in a position to absorb significantly more population. There will be parts of the world that are not going to be habitable in the way in which they are habitable now by mid-century. Uh, imagine hundreds of millions of people who live in low-lying areas of South Asia. Imagine hundreds of millions of people who live in hot, dry places that are going to get hotter and drier and are going to become very difficult to live in. New England's going to have water. We're going to have a lot of opportunity as a result, and I would submit, here speaking entirely personally, that we will have a moral obligation to accept population that we're not even thinking about right now. So in New England, not only do we have to shift load to the electric side and decarbonize the electric side, we may actually increase in population significantly by the middle of the century, if not by the end of the century. This is really a massive challenge, and it is a large planning exercise that, um, frankly, nobody is really doing. And I say that with great respect for my colleagues at ISO New England. They plan the system, they manage the system, but they're, they're not the czars of energy in New England. Nobody is. As I think Louise mentioned on the first panel, uh, you know, we make energy policy in New England you know, by governors, they do this, they do that, they'll collaborate when they want to, and I have great respect for all of our governors. Uh, but she's right. They're somewhat opportunistic. They'll do what they need to do. They'll collaborate together when it suits their needs, and they won't when, they, when it doesn't. We've seen that in the current climate, uh, which, you know, which includes six governors, two of which are elected every two years. There's a challenge right away. Uh, in two states that are important for transmission purposes, uh, you know, to note. Um, and uh, energy policy is cobbled together in some way by the states and the New England and the uh, Quebec uh, and the Canadian provinces, Quebec and the Maritime provinces, um, when it's convenient and when it's advantageous. And I do believe that there are many people involved in making this policy who are uh, thinking quite logically and strategically. Some are great leaders. We've seen some terrific leadership from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. It's great to have former Commissioner David Cash here. Dr. David Cash, excuse me, as your bio points out. Um, but it's difficult to herd these cats. Um, so that's the challenge that I think we face and which leads me to conclude that it's not everything's the same as it was in, 20, uh, in uh, 1980 and 1990. In fact, we're at a very significant inflection point. Um, 
Now is a time of enormous change. Much of what's happening is what Anne described. We've, um, the low natural gas prices have obviously had a lot of effects. One of those has been that it's enabled us to shut down a lot of our coal plants, which needed to go. Um, we've gotten off oil, which we used to burn to make electricity. We've seen more renewables come on. We're starting to see the emergence of the smart grid. Uh, if anyone has questions about that, uh, our moderator, Jenny Stevens, will respond to them. She's an expert on that. Uh, efficiency investments in the states and the provinces that are doing them are really bearing enormous amount of fruit, and we're seeing what we can do with those. And particularly in Vermont, as um, Deputy Commissioner Springer said earlier, we're seeing a great deal of distributed generation. And that I would submit, which is small production, largely renewables, uh, in some parts of the region, uh, fossil fuel based, but strategically based within the grid in order to support the grid in a way that can maximize the benefit from what we, from the grid, from our investment in the grid. Uh, the future is clearly in renewables and in, I would submit all of the New England states believe in a robust renewable energy sector within each of our states. Last night, some of the panelists um, were treated kindly by the uh, university to dinner, and uh, uh, one, of, uh, one of our hosts put out the provocative question. So, well, is it really a question of, we're gonna get transmission lines from the north or gas pipelines from the south? Which is kind of an interesting way to frame this. For those of you who are northern New England focused, I know there's been a significant natural gas um, uh, discussion in Vermont lately. Uh, you may not know that in southern New England, it's not just a discussion about natural gas. I mean, it's an onslaught. It is the, the pressure to expand the interstate natural gas pipeline into southern New England is intense. And there, there have been proposals to do it in a very big way. Um, in the same way that I think many in northern New England, particularly our friends from New Hampshire, and I know there's at least one audience member from New Hampshire, feel a bit... Um, uh, like there's been an onslaught of, of electric transmission lines coming or proposals coming from New England. My perspective on this is that either one will do, but only if done very carefully. Some expansion of natural gas used wisely is a very good thing to alleviate near-term crunches both on the electric generation side and on the heating side in New England. Uh, just like some importation of cleaner power than we uh, normally get within our system uh, in New England from Canada, from some place in Canada, is, is a very good idea. Each of those power sources coming in have to first and foremost take offline dirtier power. They have to replace dirtier stuff. And secondly, and this is an equally high priority, frankly, they have to support the development of renewable sources within New England. Power generators, power transmitters, be it natural gas or electricity, know how to craft uh, arrangements that will make that work. And I would submit that the, um, uh, the power transmitters, electricity from the north, or gas from the south or the west, that will thrive and will win in the uh, race to figure out who's going to be part of that picture on the other side of, you know, on the other side of the Escher print, are those who are savvy about that, who will understand that New England states want renewable pa power. New England states, by and large, believe in the climate science, and New England states will not negotiate for power that throws them off of the future that they're starting to see evolve in their states, which is one of widespread uh, distributed renewable generation of significant and ongoing and sustained investments in efficiency, which are after all our best investments. There are plenty of, pl there's plenty of room for good investments in efficiency going forward. Um, and importantly, and, and I, I note this in particularly, uh, in particular in light of the experience that's uh, been had in New Hampshire uh, lately, that recognizes the importance of equitably sharing the burdens and the benefits of major investments in the system. Um, I found very interesting the conversation at the last panel about the, the north-south dynamics within uh, Quebec. Uh, and obviously the First Nations in Quebec have a uh, unique 
fundamentally different position than um, any other residents of North America, quite frankly, in their region. There's a little bit of a north-south dynamic in New England that I think is worth surfacing here. The load is in the south, right? That's where people need power. Eastern Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island. Um, the transmission corridors tend to be across the north. Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, perhaps northern New York. There's the great potential, I believe, for uh, undersea uh, transmission cables, which resolve some of those issues. But um, exporters of, of power from Canada who treat northern, the northern New England states as nothing more than a transmission corridor, and I'm being somewhat flippant, and I don't mean to be offensive to anybody by that, but let's be clear about it. If that's the attitude that is perceived by the states that are being asked to accept those projects, um, those projects, in my opinion, will have a far harder time getting to market uh, and will, um, by, the, by virtue of uh, projecting that approach or taking that approach, will make it very difficult to for all the parties to engage in the kind of collaborative discussion about the terms on which the power is going to be used in New England. So I would strongly suggest that whether it's a gas pipeline from anywhere uh, or, uh, a, or a transmission power line from anywhere, um, there ought to be significant uh, attention paid to what's in it for the communities that are going to host that power line. And those are conversations that have to be had way up front. And I think there are some projects in the works today that are doing, that have learned from some of that experience and are doing a very good job with it. Uh, finally, let me just note that uh, back to agree with our colleague Louise, one thing that really hasn't changed is that nobody plans this. Uh, and I, I offer this for everybody in the room, but particularly the students. Could I just note how many students are there in the room today? Terrific. Uh, are any of you interested in political science or government or uh, the policy side of things, that's great. You've got a career ahead of you, let me just say. Um, we are, just as we don't have a global energy policy and we don't have a national energy policy, we don't have a regional energy policy. And we don't have a governance system that is designed or even suited quite frankly, to developing that policy. ISO New England does a terrific job keeping all of the masters that it has to observe, and it's, it's independent, I understand that. Um, but it's a very difficult balancing act to deal with six different governors who are turning over, and you've got utility companies, you've got FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, every now and then saying, oh, and you've got to do what you do to respect the words of this, the needs of the state. The states in the region, you've got environmental groups like many, you know, pushing uh, their agendas. It's tough. It's very tough. This is, this, this is sausage making, sadly, um, with, with a lot of money at stake and very high stakes if we don't do it right. Um, it isn't to say we have an unreliable system. We don't. We have a highly reliable system. And that's one thing that I think has been accepted as a, as a given. But I would submit to you that in this respect, it is 1980 again. It is 1990 again. And um, uh, just as uh, many uh, companies that have, that are private companies that uh, carry out uh, public interest activities or into activities that have a, a public good element in them have begun to open up their governance to greater involvement by those who represent the public, I believe that that's going to be necessary if we're going to do this right, which is to say efficiently and with a good outcome at the regional scale. For, so for those students who are interested in this, I encourage you to dive in. I'd be happy to talk with you at the break. So thank you very much. I am very pleased to be here. I, I like the place. Nice place, yeah. <laughs> so um, uh, I am going. I 
I am a low-tech person. Stu students do this all the time for me, so I never had to learn. It works. Uh, uh, here is the here is a, uh, the outline you know, of my presentation. Uh, basically, uh, in Quebec, we are in the process now of uh, updating the energy policy, and uh, the uh, there is a, a wide uh, set of questions that are being addressed. Now, uh, you see on the screen the uh, main topics of interest. So let me point out what uh, challenge the Quebecers are facing in this respect. Uh, first, uh, energy efficiency. Energy efficiency has been uh, mentioned quite a few times uh, this morning. Now, we know that the purpose of energy efficiency program is to increase the ratio of energy uh, service relative to energy use. So uh, basically, we want to do more with less. Now, a uh, program of this nature has been implemented uh, since the oil crisis of the 70s, and they have given rise to what economists call the energy efficiency gap. By this, we mean that uh, users don't realize as much energy saving as standard cost-benefit analysis will indicate. So that's what we call the energy efficiency gap. And uh, you know, various uh, factors have been pointed out to explain this gap. Uh, one is the so-called rebound effect. You know, energy service becomes cheaper, so people use more of it. Uh, also, there is the, uh, uh, the free rider problem, you know, that uh, some of this that we observe will have taken place anyway. So the outcome of the program is less than expected. And there are the uh, unmeasured costs of, uh, of implementing this program f for the people who uh, are subject to this program and for the people who de deliver them. So uh, th these programs are, are not as efficient as we would like. Now, uh, this problem is particularly severe in Quebec because Quebec has one of the lowest electricity rates in North America, if not the world. So basically, standard cost-benefit analysis give rise to less uh, worthwhile program. So if we want to realize roughly the same thing as the neighbor, we have to put a larger effort. Now, uh, unless the government of Quebec is willing to move the rate up, the challenge will be on the, on the table for the next year years to come. So I'm not going to say more about this because th there is a, a very uh, strong re uh, feeling uh, of Quebecers about you know, rate increase. So uh, here we will be talking of much larger magnitude than what we observe from year to year. Now let me move to uh, renewable energy. Uh, the first question I want to address is, uh, you know, uh, is the question of the development at this stage. Do Quebec need more electricity now? And we are in a surplus position, so we don't need more electricity now. So uh, before analyzing with what type of uh, renewable energy source we need to develop, we should also consider the need itself. Uh, so right now, uh, there is no immediate need for new uh, source of electricity because you know, there is a, a debate about how, bar, how big is the surplus, but it is there, and it is fairly big. Uh, big enough for the government to have implemented a surplus a policy with respect to you know, getting over this, uh, this uh, energy surplus. Now, uh, so uh, b basically, when we consider renewa renewable energy at this stage, specifically a uh, hydro project, we should be uh, concerned with respect to the market you know, for, uh, for this electricity. Uh, we must recall, you know, as I've mentioned, we have real cheap rates in Quebec. It has definite impact. Uh, and this is based on costs. And there, there have never been any subsidy, direct subsidy from Hydro Quebec to, to uh, its, uh, its utility. So 
overall, over time, uh, Hydro-Quebec must have done a reasonable job, so that costs are low. Now, uh, we have developed hydropower site uh, through an increasing order of costs, and that was the thing to do. Uh, and the manifestation of this is that we are moving further and further north. You know, cheap, cheap accessible site were developed first, and now we are way north. Now, uh, since, you know, uh, we, ha we are moving north, we are, uh, costs are moving up too. And uh, uh, right now, what we call the marginal cost, the cost of new development, is much higher than the average. You know, let us say that the average is something like three cents per kilowatt hour. Now, uh, new power site, like Lara Man, uh, there is a, a bit of dispute, but it is definitely way above that. Uh, according to my own calculation, like eight cents per kilowatt hour. And, and the next uh, hydropower site will be more expensive. You know, we are moving up. So the question that we have to consider as a Quebecer is, is there a market now, either internally or uh, within the neighboring uh, region, is there a market for electricity at eight cents per kilowatt hour? And nobody now is showing up at the border and say, look, I would like to sign a contract for 20, 25 years at that price. Nobody. So, uh, and obviously, aluminum plants don't want electricity at 8 cents per kilowatt hour. They're, they're, you know, their kind of ceiling is something like 3 cents. You know, we, we, we don't want to pay more than, than 3 cents. So there is a huge gap there. And uh, right now, you know, there is no urgency uh, either in Quebec or uh, within the neighboring region. Ontario has, has surplus too. Uh, new, uh, new England, I think, is in no rush to uh, have additional supply. We may find all kind of strategic reason to change the mix of a, a electricity source, but uh, right now there is no uh, there is no urgency. So. Uh, uh, that's, I think, a, fund a fundamental question. Uh, you know, uh, other things w will stay uh, on the table, and maybe as time goes on, it will be time to address. But at this stage, I don't think it is uh, uh, that, you know, the market is presenting a good opportunity for uh, long-term development of renewable uh, power source at this high cost. Yeah. Now, there, uh, 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 Quebec has one valuable asset that will stay there for a long time. Although, we, you know, right now there is a lot of uh, work that is go on, going on to find a way to store electricity because of this incoming uh, intermittent, uh, intermittent power. Uh, so th there is a, a need for that even in a slow-growing system. Now, Quebec has... Uh, a, a huge asset there that has been mentioned this, mo this morning. It is the capacity to store water, you know, and it's there and it will stay there for years. So uh, when th the times come to develop further renewable power, which will be most probably intermittent, either from sun or wind, I, I think that uh, this will still be very uh, valuable. Now, uh, we have not talked about much about oil. Uh, uh, in that respect, uh, Quebec is no, no different from the other region, uh, neighboring region. You know, there is a concern about the long-term impact of uh, uh, fossil f fuel use. Obviously, the, the context in Quebec is, 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 is different. Uh, here, I would definitely would like to point out the difference between the consumption and production. Uh, for consumption, our concern is very much like everybody else, and also, uh, uh, you know, there are a lot of talks about uh, using more electricity. Now, using more electricity, I come back to my, the point I, I have already made. You know, new electricity in Quebec is not cheap. So if we want to move that, uh, that way, uh, the cheap electricity is already used. Do we want to increase rates so that people would stop, you know, heating their house with electricity? That's a big challenge. Uh, 
So uh, de de developing uh, new hydro, uh, de developing new source of electricity to support a shift from fossil use in transportation to uh, electricity use, uh, you know, the challenge will not be very different from res relative to the other area ar around us. Now, uh, <coughs> we have also once in a while a debate about uh, oil production in Quebec. Uh, we are not a producer now, or a tiny, tiny little one. So uh, here, you know, uh, just want to stress that as an economist, we shouldn't make the difference between consumption and production. There are a lot of people who would like to uh, slow down the use of oil, but uh, curbing uh, production is not the way. Curbing consumption is. So uh, when, uh, when the question come up whether we should develop some oil, uh, I think it should be looked at from the you know, profitable basis for the whole society, but whether we produce it uh, or not, we'll still be using it. Thank you. I failed to mention that we are one year ahead with respect to the uh, formulation of a new policy in Quebec. You know, we, we should have waited uh, what will be the outcome of the uh, Paris meeting on, on climate change at the international level. not taking any chances on the electronics. There's nothing will kill your credibility sooner than not being able to work the slide projector. So, uh, Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Steve Molivetz. I am the Vice President of Business Development for HQUS. We are a subsidiary of Hydro-Quebec and we are based in Hartford, Connecticut. Um, we sort of feel like we have a resource that, unlike any other gener generating resource, can address a wide range of reliability and public policy challenges in the region. Um, but, but that resource isn't without its challenges to get more into the region. And, and talked about a little of the regional challenges. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the challenges of transmission so we can bring more of that product in. Um, <clears throat> HQ, as we like to call it, is among the largest electric, electric utilities in Canada. We're one of the largest hydropower producers in the world. Um, the company generates, transmits, and distributes electricity in Quebec. Essentially, we are the utility in Quebec. So, you know, here in Vermont, for the most part, it's Green Mountain Power. In the province of Quebec, it's Hydro-Quebec. Uh, we also sell electricity on the wholesale markets. Um, we do that here in Vermont and New England. Um, and predominantly, that function is handled uh, out of our uh, Hartford office. Um, and finally, the company's sole sh shareholder is the province of Quebec. This is a map of our grid that you've probably seen numerous times and probably numerous times already uh, today. Um, 44,000 megawatts of renewable energy. Uh, just to give you a point of comparison, in all of New England there is roughly 32,000 megawatts of capacity. Um, the dots across the province show our major hydro facilities. Um, you see way over on the right is a project you've heard talked about a couple of times today, La Romaine, uh, four stations. Um, by 2020, we'll be bringing on another 1,550 megawatts of clean, renewable hydropower. I think uh, when you look at this, at this map, and unfortunately it's not great at showing um, uh, New England in the proximity to Quebec, but I think here in New England we need to think about uh, that proximity as a ge geographic advantage for the region, right? We've got a tremendous hydropower resource just to our north, and an energy partner who's interested in extending and expanding the long-term energy relationships that we already have. Um, we also have one of the largest transmission systems in the world, 21,000 miles of high, uh, high voltage transmission lines. There are two interconnections, as you've heard earlier today, with New England. Um, uh, one that's about an 1,800 megawatt interconnection into Western Mass, and the other is about 225 megawatts here in Vermont. Uh, and we're also looking at a new interconnection. The project's called Northern Pass. Uh, we are partnering with our partners at Eversource Energy, uh, formerly Northeast Utilities. 
where we will construct uh, and own and operate a 47-mile line on the Quebec side of the border, and they will own and operate a 187-mile line uh, from, southern, from the Quebec-New uh, Hampshire border into southern New Hampshire, and we would be the energy supplier on that line. It's a 1,200-megawatt high-voltage DC line. Um, Hydro-Quebec is connected to four major northeast markets, New York, New England, Ontario, and the Maritimes. Uh, we like to think of our markets as complementary to our export markets. Uh, by that, we mean that we peak in the winter, uh, driven mainly by uh, electric heating load, as you've heard people talk about today. And our export markets, for the most part, are summer peaking and driven by um, uh, summer air conditioning load. So that's a great synergy in terms of exports to the region. Uh, so by exporting uh, to these four markets based on economics, we make each of those markets more efficient. From one year to the next, we export about 30 terawatt hours a year. Of that 30 terawatt hours, about half uh, ends up typically in uh, the New England market. Um, just to give you again a sense of magnitude, 30 terawatt hours is about 25 percent of the total consumption in the New England region. Um, and again, of those 30 terawatt hours, 1.2 terawatt hours is currently under long-term contract to the Vermont Utilities. Uh, Hydro Quebec signed its first long-term uh, agreement with uh, Vermont Utilities in the late 80s. In 2010, HQS signed a second agreement, uh, again 225 megawatts for a long-term supply of clean renewable hydropower. Um, I think Vermonters, um, I'm not sure if they realize it or not, but benefited greatly from that contract in these past several winters where the rest of uh, New England retail consumers were seeing roughly 30 percent rate increases, uh, in part because of the, this contract and its sort of price smoothing and dampening formulas, I uh, didn't see anywhere near those types of impacts. And as you can see from this graph, um, you know, the contract showing down below the roughly two terawatt hours, that little green uh, horizontal bar on the bottom, there's plenty of room uh, for other New England states and utilities to consider long-term contracts with Hydro-Quebec. Uh, including winter deliveries. There tends to be a, a, a misperception that because uh, Hydro-Quebec is winter peaking and New England is currently experiencing some, some winter challenges that Hydro-Quebec can't help during that period, uh, simply isn't true. During uh, the peak periods in, in our coldest spell uh, this past January, we were exporting roughly 1,700 megawatts an hour. This is one of the major benefits uh, that Hydro-Quebec provides uh, to New England. At a time when greenhouse gas emissions and carbon footprints are on everyone's agenda, hydropower generated in Quebec is one of the lowest carbon emitting sources of energy, pretty much equal to wind uh, on the basis of a uh, life cycle analysis. Over the last five years, Hydro-Quebec's exports to its neighboring systems have avoided 62 million tons of carbon dioxide, and that's equal to the annual emissions of 16 million vehicles. Uh, Anne touched on this uh, briefly, and you've heard uh, others mention it as well, um, but, but I'm going to dive in a little bit deeper, um, that we feel our deliveries into the region help with a number of uh, New England's energy challenges, and I want to touch on those uh, briefly. Uh, the first challenge is reliability. Uh, as Anne talked about, the increase in uh, natural gas fire generation having gone from about 15 percent in 2000 to roughly 44 percent this past year which by itself uh, isn't necessarily a bad thing and has some environmental benefits, generally replacing dirtier fuel. Uh, the problem is the pipeline system to bring gas to those generators hasn't kept pace. It's a pipeline system that was really built for um, residential and, and uh, commercial heating load. So in the winter months when that pipeline's being used uh, to meet that peak demand, there's very little natural gas left for uh, natural gas fire generation and the little gas that is left is going to be very high priced. And very high priced gas leads to very high priced uh, electric markets. Uh, I think the ISO estimate from this past winter is that wholesale uh, energy costs were $3 billion higher than the previous winter, predominantly because of this issue. So uh, the, the increased reliance in natural gas has both reliability and consumer cost issues. The final challenge is the region's desire to transition to clean energy sources. 
I think most of us are probably aware of uh, the aggressive RPS targets in the region, but the states have also uh, pursued uh, legislation and programs to reduce uh, GHG emissions significantly. I like to think that there is a hydro opportunity for the region, and let me tell you what I mean by that. Essentially, <clears throat> we think the hydro opportunity is achieving multiple market fundamental and public policy benefits with a single resource. There's a couple points on this table I'd just like to touch on. Uh, first of all, new supply. The ISO has estimated that 8,300 megawatts of non-gas generation is at risk to retire by 2020. <clears throat> and these retirements have already begun. 4,100 megawatts in the 2013-14 timeframe, including Vermont Yankee. We think of new hydro resources as being poised to help fill that gap. The second is cost. Incremental energy supply from a low operating source like hydro will have downward pressure on wholesale prices. Economics 101, new supply, same demand, prices are gonna go down. <clears throat> and finally, flexibility. Hydro, especially when it's, uh, when it's combined with high voltage DC technology, is an extremely dispatchable almost instantaneous technology. This means it can balance various variable resources and help meet peak load demands. So if hydropower offers all these great solutions, what's the issue with getting more of it into the region? Why haven't we been able to accomplish that? <clears throat> Probably the first issue that comes to mind is the funding model for the new transmission projects that are needed to deliver additional hydropower. Given the economics of such projects and the current market conditions, a regional funding or beneficiary pays model is needed. Although it's probably a surprise to many of the people in the room, this isn't a tremendously new idea. This is in fact how the vast majority of all the transmission in the region is developed. The $7 billion that's, that's been built recently worth of new transmission in New England and the, I think the $4.1 billion that's projected that Ann mentioned, all that will be regionally funded. The second thing is siting, and we've talked about this several times today, a major challenge for any, any energy infrastructure project, whether it's electricity, whether it's transmission, gas pipelines, uh, wind farms, communities are reluctant to site energy infrastructure projects in their backyards. <clears throat> we completely understand and respect the siting challenge. I think the big issue here is to balance costs, the increased costs of siting challenges with the siting process itself. Third, there's no market mechanism to recognize the, the value that hydropower brings to the region, right? The various attributes that hydropower has that maybe aren't, aren't uh, applicable to other generating resources, right? RPS, uh, for the most part, doesn't qualify hydro. There's not a fuel diversity uh, bonus for hydro projects. So uh, somehow a, a market mechanism to recognize these additional uh, benefits that hydro brings is gonna need to come forward if we're gonna get more of the product into the market. And finally, to meet the ambitious goals that New England has set for itself, we need to recognize that all types of renewable energy are needed, whether it's domestic, international, whether it's wind, whether it's solar, or whether it's hydro. Uh, we're gonna need them all. So a little bit less of the infighting of my renewables better than your renewable, we think would, would go a long way. <clears throat> Fortunately, it is not all gloom and doom. Uh, despite the issues uh, facing increased access to hydropower into the region, there are several initiatives underway that recognize the need for action and solutions. Uh, for the past several years, NESCO, the New England State's Committee on Electricity, has been studying the issue and has essentially concluded that new energy infrastructure is needed. Specifically, the six New England governors have recognized that new gas pipeline transmission capacity and new uh, electric transmission to low carbon resources is going to be needed if the region's gonna remain competitive. Increased hydropower will lower the demand for natural gas from the power sector and in turn can stabilize prices. Just last month, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island issued a draft three-state RFP uh, to procure clean energy and transmission. And along with this, Massachusetts is considering legislation that would allow uh, the state to contract for significant quantities of additional hydropower. Along with our partners at Eversource, we're working to consider how our Northern Pass project can fit into a competitive solicitation, uh, given the advanced state of the uh, permitting and the efforts that are being made to solve the siting issues, along with all the various studies that have done, 
we're confident the project is well poised uh, to take advantage of this. So in conclusion, uh, Hydro-Quebec is the largest hydropower producer in North America and one of the largest in the world. We operate a world-class generation and transmission system. And we feel we can be a solutions provider for the challenges facing the New England region. So thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to the questions. Okay, well, thank you all to all four of our panelists. We had a very interesting, distinct, but complimentary perspectives, I think, that we, we just heard. So what I'd like to do is um, open it up. Uh, I think our speakers uh, did go over the eight minute limit. So we have uh, about 15 minutes before lunch. Um, so I would like to open it up directly and to, to questions. And I'd ask that people stand and identify yourself um, and address if you have a specific question to specific panelists and, and in, to enable uh, maximum participation, uh, let's, let's all try to be brief in our responses and in, in the questions. So let's open it up. We have students who have uh, microphones and their hands up already. So if people could, um, okay, here in, the, here in the front middle, could. Somebody, here we go. Thank you, and please yeah, introduce yourself. And Thank you, uh, Tom McGrath, Rice Memorial High School. Uh, according to the program, you, this panel is um, intended to address economic, social, and environmental concerns. They were touched upon briefly, I think. Um, but I think maybe, Mr. Council, you address them, perhaps the economic, and environmental, and social issues um, to the most extent. What I see is uh, a glaring omission from this morning's panel to this one is the uh, abri aboriginal concerns, right? And especially I, I see it, it's not, it didn't even appear in the uh, presentation from Hydro-Quebec. So as the sole representative here and spokesperson for Hydro-Quebec, is, is it a done deal, the sort of negotiations or, or concerns of aboriginal peoples? and and how these projects um, impact them, or, or are there's these concerns still ongoing as far as you're concerned? Well, I think it's at this point in the program where I need to um, emphasize the U.S. portion of my title. So I, I, I represent Hydro-Quebec U.S., and I don't mean to dodge the question because I think it's a, it's a great question and very important. But I think what I'd say is <clears throat> Hydro-Quebec has pioneered um, uh, relations and negotiations with uh, Aboriginal communities. And there is a process in Quebec to get sites, uh, projects cited and uh, approved and built, right? It's not the Wild West up there where they're running roughshod over uh, native populations with no laws, no regulations. The, there's Canadian and there's provincial laws and siting processes, and what we do is participate in those, in those processes, and no project goes forward unless three criterion are met from the company, which is it's got to be profitable based on our, uh, our projections of export and domestic markets, it's got to be environmentally acceptable, and it needs to be accepted by the local community. And that third one is important, and I, th I don't think we're any project, and probably when this building was built, my guess is there were folks who opposed it. And even when the siting process was uh, concluded and, and it got approved, there were probably still some folks who didn't want this building built, yet, yet here it is. So I don't mean to be flip. What I, what I mean to say is I don't think there's ever 100% acceptance of any, uh, uh, any project, and certainly a infrastructure project of the magnitude that Hydro-Quebec builds is, is much more impactful and therefore uh, deserves a bigger hearing than a, than a building like this. But it's never going to be 100%. So I think... Uh, the best answer I can give you is absolutely it's ongoing. Absolutely Hydro-Quebec takes it very seriously. And, and the projects don't move forward unless they're accepted by the, by the local community through that process, not, not through 100% acceptance uh, of every member of the community. Thank you very much for that question. Do any of the other panelists want to address that or should we move, move on? Yeah, okay, there's lots of other questions too. So, okay, how about in the back here? Uh, Fran <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Francis Lacombe with uh, Technostrobe in uh, Montreal. 
Mr. Castle spoke about the, uh, the importance of transportation and, and, and the importance of decarbonization of, of transportation. I was wondering if Mr. Bernard has actually examined this notion that the competing price for electricity can actually be a $60 tank of gas that goes 60 kilometers as opposed to a three cent a kilowatt hour for the aluminum industry. Is there an opportunity there when we're, decarbonization, we're, when we're decarbonizing transportation for a greater price for electricity? Quick comment. Uh, I have uh, written a fairly extensi extensively on the uh, kind of uh, indirect subsidy that uh, government of Quebec is providing to the al aluminum industry to a uh, low price. And uh, this is a practice that I don't favor. Now, right, <laughs> right now, we have favorable circumstances, so this makes me worry. Because, you know, we have surplus, and uh, when you have surplus, you can, you know, you are looking for the best alternative that you have uh, on the table, and obviously, uh, aluminum, the aluminum industry is uh, looking at that too. So, uh, hopefully, you know, uh, the government will resist because this will imply further development of uh, hydro resource in Quebec, uh, and as I've mentioned, that this will not cover the the price that the aluminum industry uh, want to pay. Now, uh, the, uh, with respect to uh, electrification of uh, the transportation sector, uh, here, you know, uh, uh, you know this is a, gl a global issue. Uh, obviously, uh, we will make uh, inroad in, in that direction when, uh, when a large number of people buy willingly uh, electric car or, you know, car that don't e e emit uh, greenhouse gas. Um, Quebec may, may have some resource, but again, we must not forget that additional uh, electricity in Quebec is almost as expensive as what it, we observe in the neighboring region. The cheap electricity in Quebec is the one that we sell to ourselves at very low price. So until we get o over that, uh, I don't think that will make huge uh, headway toward uh, electrification of the transportation sector. If I may just add, we put a price on carbon, this all happens by the market. We just, you tell me when that's going to happen. Uh, but that's, that gets to the governance question. Um, Amy Seidel from the Rubenstein School of Environmental Studies here at UVM. Um, I really appreciated the emphasis that all the panelists uh, brought to their presentations on carbon mitigation and climate change. And I, I saw it everywhere, whether we were talking about renewables or, or targets. Uh, but I didn't hear anybody talk about climate adaptation and how good um, an entirely centralized uh, transmission works in uh, an era of ecological uncertainty. Although we did hear from um, Anne about the rise of renewables and the possibility of solar working from a decentralized position, I didn't hear from others about what kind of resilience are we developing to increasing uncertainty and variability in climate um, that then uh, puts our, our electricity systems at risk. So I'd just like to hear comments from any of the panelists on that point. Who would like to? Well, I'll just add, um, we are seeing uh, a lot of movement to, oh boy. <laughs> to uh, more microgrids, um, more of this distributed uh, fanned out um, energy um, grid type system. Um, so we are, you know, we're seeing the transformation happen and I think that's only gonna to grow in the future. Um, how that is managed is going to be tricky. It adds to the complexity of managing what's on what's what's on the regional grid and what's off the regional grid, and how do you watch what's going and how do you manage that? And so it's going to add to the complexity, but we definitely see that um, movement happening. And I think as uh, more and more customers get involved in their energy usage and energy choice, it's going to just make the whole system much more complex. And you're going to need resources available. Uh, to manage that that variability, um, and so the the um, 
quick start available flexible resources are going to even be more important in the future if I could just add it's a great question there's it's an it's a great opportunity for us it's just another part of the system that's changing and it's an expensive part of the system Vermont hasn't we don't have coastline we haven't had an ocean here in 10 12,000 years I don't think but uh, if you've been to the coast of New England you know that there are huge lots of components of the electric energy system that are very much at risk they have to be uh, we have to plan carefully to build them, rebuild them in a way that's resilient. I think ISO New England and its planning function is doing a great job with the utilities, which are doing a very good job of watching for this. Uh, but it's just another example of how we're about to reinvest in our energy system in New England, whether we like it or not. So it's an opportunity to do it in an intentional way that will promote a resilient system going forward. Sorry, in the back. Yeah. Yes, I, I would like uh, Kosai Samak, uh, University of Montreal, um, Environment Sustainable Development uh, Graduate Program. I would like to commend uh, the lady who asked the question about adaptability. I think we have a, a, an absolute obligation to do that, and I think there is confusion, uh, even if we believe that the climate is governed by anthropologically bound carbon emissions, the implicit idea that when, if we reduce that, we're not going to have Sandy in New York or Katrina in New Orleans is a terrible problem. I think the issue of resilience is a major stake for humanity and we need to pay attention to that. Just as much attention as carbon. And now, Monsieur Bernard, I would like to ask a question from a strictly rational or rationalist economic perspective. Uh, understanding the question of energy density and the impacts of renewables, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Taking uh, Quebec as an example, where we have uh, a surplus, but we also have a drive that seems to be there that has a, a legitimate political presence in society about promoting wind and so on. If you look at this from the perspective of optimal use of electricity and the limits on energy storage and the costs of batteries and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, what, what would you conclude by way of uh, a sum up in terms of what economic rationality teaches us? As I've told, you know, the uh, capacity to uh, store, basically, electricity is, is quite huge in Quebec. So since uh, in, uh, it is still the of, uh, official position of the government to develop further wind power in Quebec, although right now, you know, I, I think this is too fast because we're, right, we don't need electricity. So... Uh, uh, this capacity will, uh, will, will stay there. You know, it's, it, uh, it was not developed for that purpose, basically, but now it plays that role, and I think that will stay ver very valuable for a long time. And uh, uh, wh whether how we could improve this capacity, uh, I don't know, but I think we should pay uh, close attention to that. I think we have time for one more question, but I also just wanted to return to this, this comment about resiliency and climate adaptation. And I think one thing that um, we need to keep in mind is this balance and complementarity between decentralized systems, energy systems, where, where individuals, households, and communities have the power to have more influence and engagement with their energy system versus large scale, um, uh, large scale utility scale, centralized systems, and I think that's a real tension, and um, obviously we need both as we move forward, and both are moving forward, but I think the resiliency questions are particularly relevant when we think about enhancing the decentralized systems, and that's in, in, uh, similar to what Anne, what Anne was mentioning, too. Um, I think we have time for one more question before lunch, um, and I want to make sure I've um, look, uh, looked at different parts of the room, and I think we have a student in the back here that I would like to... Um, welcome in. 
please introduce yourself. Thank you. My name is Brendan Kloon. I am a junior at UVM, and I just was curious. This is a, ma mainly a question for Mr. Molodates and Ms. George, but anybody on the panel can answer. Uh, concerning the interconnection between the renewable distributors in Quebec, like Hydro Quebec, and like between them and the major distributors down, mainly in the southern part of New England, Nat Grid, and Star, etc., has that relationship been generally constructive and positive, or has it been more, say, um, with feet dragging and resistance um, with these? networks that traditionally rely on less renewable resources, and how do you see that relationship proceeding in the future? Uh, yeah, it, great question. If I understand it correctly, um, uh, I think the relate, for the most part, the end grids, the end stars, the ever sources, they are not themselves uh, heavily involved in renewable energy sales, right? They are more buyers of renewable energy power as, as their various state RPS programs require them to. Um, as it relates to the, the transmission project we're partnering with or other transmission opportunities, I think, to, to be honest with you, they all frankly look at it as an opportunity uh, to, to make a positive impact for New England in terms of all the benefits I talked about. So, we have had conversations with probably every one of the, uh, of the existing utilities in New England about the idea of what is the best way to get more uh, hydro back hydropower into the region. And the reason they're interested is twofold. One is, one is uh, kind of shareholder related, and that is, sure, they're, they're interested in uh, developing a transmission line that they'll earn a return on. And the other, I think, is a little more altruistic and is in the, in the interest of their customers because they see the benefits we do and they see the challenges we see, which is the over-reliance over on natural gas. And what are we gonna do about that? If not, hydro go back hydropower as a new baseload resource uh, uh, um, uh, enabled by a new transmission line, what is the new baseload uh, source of power gonna be in New England? I think they look at, is it more gas? Well, that tends to exacerbate the, the, the pipeline problem we talked about. Is it another nuke? I find it hard to believe. I mean, my bracket is busted in the NCAA, but I think I can figure this one out. There, there is not going to be another nuke uh, built in New England, right? Coal and oil have the environmental uh, emissions um, problems we talked about. So we're down to other, uh, you know, uh, hydro back hydropower and other renewables. The other renewables tend to be uh, less available in terms of just the sheer quantity, and they tend to be uh, intermittent, whether it's solar and, and requiring the sun or whether it's wind and requiring um, uh, requiring the wind to blow, whether it's uh, wind power. So uh, I think they saw the hydro opportunity kind of as I outlined it as sort of a benefit for the region and their customers and, and sort of pursued it from that perspective. That was a really long-winded way of saying it's all been great. <laughs> And I, I would just add, you know, I think it's been interesting watching the states develop their renewable energy portfolios. When they first started discussing them in the, you know, late or mid, mid 90s timeframe, um, it, it was seen as let's focus on the small renewables, the new renewables, the um, things that can be built either in my state or in my region. And so there was a reluctance to look at large hydro. There still is the remnants of that. But I think, as uh, Steve mentioned, as the desires on the states have, have grown to do more renewables, to meet climate goals, they're looking at what are the scale of resources that they're going to need. And that's when hydro c comes into play, large hydro comes into play. And so I think that is changing the, the nature of the relationships among Hydro-Quebec and the New England states. Great. Well, thank you all. And before, uh, hopefully we can continue these conversations at lunch. There is a program during the, l the lunch break. We have student awards will be presented and a, and a speaker. And then we will reconvene back in this room at 2.30. Um, so thank you all for your participation. Let's thank our speakers one more time. Thank you.